Are we rolling? Yep. Okay. Today we're going to talk about a new topic. We're going to talk about field programmable gate arrays. Um, I put together a few charts. Uh, a field programmable gate array is a, uh, an array of general purpose uh, logic gates, uh, uh, including logic blocks, flip flops, and some memory that are electrically programmable. Uh, in order to inter interconnect them by the user once you've purchased uh, the part. Uh, they're purchased unprogrammed, and then they're programmed by the user to perform a specific function. This is different from a custom integrated circuit where you design and manufacture the part to perform this, the function at the manufacturer's. The field programmable gate array is more general. When you buy it, you then program it to uh, perform that function. Uh, the interconnections are a network of wires that are electrically programmed to the logic and to each other by the user to perform that specific function, which again is different from a custom IC where all the wires are built into the part at, at the manufacturer and it performs that one function then from the very beginning. There are two types of FPGAs. One type is, uh, is, pro is programmed by anti-fuses where you blow the fuses to, uh, in to perform the interconnects. So these are only one time programmable. Once it's programmed, it then performs the user function, but it can't be, uh, it can't be reprogrammed. The other type, and the type that we're gonna be talking about, are SRAM based, where all the interconnects are stored in a, in a memory. Um, and that clearly can be reprogrammed by just simply rewriting uh, the memory. Uh, uh, why do we wanna use FPGAs? Well, this statement comes from the Xilinx website. FP FPGAs avoid the high initial cost of a custom integrated circuit. The long development cycles, um, a, a, a custom integrated circuit can take more, more than a year to design and manufacture, but an FPGA can be programmed in just a few minutes. The inherent inflexibility of conventional ASICs, as I indicated, once you've per designed and bought an ASIC, it does that one thing forever. And if you design it incorrectly, you've got to go through that whole design cycle again. And you can also, uh, with an FPGA, you can change your program as new versions of the software perhaps become available and you want to change the function to upgrade to a, to a, new, uh, a new version of the, of the, uh, of the program. Uh, we're going to talk about the Xilinx Spartan 3A, which is the FPGA that we're going to be, uh, going to be using later on in here. Um, the, uh, the FPGA cons consists of five different types of, uh, of, of blocks. The first we're going to talk about is the configurable logic blocks. The, this is where the logic is performed. The, the CLBs contain lookup tables, and we're going to talk about how the lookup tables work to implement the logic. They also contain storage elements, that, uh, including flip-flops and latches. And then the, these configurable logic blocks form the core of the FPGA. They perform the logic function that we're going to, uh, that we're going to implement in, in the FPGA. There's also block RAM in the FPGA. There's, there's memory that can be accessed by the logic, um, and there's a, there's a variable amount of, of memory in the FPGA that can be uh, connected. In the, in the Spartan 3A family, they're implemented as 18,000 bit, 18 kilobit uh, memory blocks. Um, and it, it's dual port memory, which means that it can be read and written uh, in different locations simultaneously. There's two different uh, access ports in the memory. There are also multiplier bot blocks. One very common function in FPGA is the multiplication function. And so there are 18-bit uh, multipliers that are uh, implemented in the FPGA uh, for the, again, for the user to program into his function. Or again, ignore if, you're, if your particular um, function doesn't include a multiplication uh, function. Uh, there are input-output blocks. Clearly, we've got to get information into the FPGA and out of the FPGA uh, onto other circuits on the, on the same board uh, or into the outside world. These I.O. blocks support three-state operation. Uh, that means that if your architecture uh, in includes a bus where several output drivers, uh, output buffers are trying to drive the bus, you don't ever want those buffers to be trying to drive information onto the bus uh, simultaneously. So you would activate one buffer, which could then be in its lower high state, depending on whether you wanted to output a zero or a one, while all the other buffers that are connected to the bus would be in this third state, which is the disabled state. So that only one, bu only one uh, buffer is actually driving the bus at the same time. That avoids conflicts, and, and in fact, if you don't do things like that, you can damage uh, your circuit. Uh, double data rate registers are also included in the uh, IO blocks. And 
finally, the last block are the digital clock manager blocks. It's very important that we get clock signals distributed around the F FPGA with very little mm -hmm. clock skew. The clock skew is the difference between the clock uh, pulse that comes in at one edge of the chip and that same clock pulse has to be distributed to other part portions of the chip. And if they're a long distance away from the, from the place where the clock is generated, the, uh, it's going to be delayed by a little bit of time. That's called the clock skew. So we have these digital clock managers distributed around the uh, FPGA to simultaneously uh, synchronize all the clock pulses so they reach the logic at very close to the, uh, at the same time. So we, we can trigger all of our uh, clock pulses all over the entire chip simultaneously. There are several clock, uh, there may be more than one clock. You may want to um, implement uh, several, a uh, two phase, or even a three phase clock, so that when one set of pulses is high, another set of pulses is in its low state, and then uh, that allows you to double, essentially double the rate uh, that logic can go through the, the FPGA by, by uh, having two different clocks, one, one going high when the other's low, and then the other switching low when, when the second clock goes high. Um, we're going to show uh, how these, uh, the, how these uh, different blocks are organized in the FPGA. Uh, this is a uh, kind of a blurry uh, image that I took from the Xilinx website. But you can see that these configurable logic blocks, which actually form the, the heart of the FPGA, are distributed all over the, the, the FPGA in the center, along the edges. And then the other blocks that we mentioned, including the I.O. blocks, which you see around all the way around the outside uh, edge of the chip, um, the block RAM, which is, which is configured along these uh, stripes on each side of the FPGA. There's a multiplier, and one, there's one multiplier uh, associated with each 18 kilobit memory, um, uh, also uh, deployed in these stripes. And then there are digital clock managers, two at the top, two at the bottom, and then a few on the, uh, on the sides to try to get the clock distributed around the part uh, at approximately the same time. Um, so, as we indicated, there's the I.O. blocks around the edges of the, of the, uh, of the uh, FPGA. Uh, there's two columns of block RAM. Uh, each column has uh, several of these 18K RAM blocks, and then there's a dedicated multiplier associated with each uh, block RAM. Digital clock managers, as we indicated. Um, there's also this rich network of routing that connects, that essentially is unprogrammed when you buy the FPGA, and it, and it extends all over the entire chip. We'll show how that works in just a minute. Um, then each functional element has a, a switching matrix that allows that element to con be connected either to its nearest neighbors or up to the routing network where, it where the signals can be. The inputs and the outputs from that particular block can be uh, distributed uh, anywhere, anywhere else on the, uh, on the chip. Um, this is a blow up of one corner of the FPGA. It's here's the digital clock manager. Here's all the individual uh, configurable logic blocks. Uh, and, and as you can see, they, they stick them uh, any place they have a few uh, square microns of space. And then the strip that has the block RAM and the multiplier in it, uh, you can see that there's a block RAM dedicated to a specific multiplier right next to it. And the I.O. blocks <coughs> across the top and the bottom. So um, in order to um, write a program into the FPGA, we have to have an SRAM-based <coughs> configuration memory that remembers which interconnects, which blocks are connected to which wire, which blocks are conne connected to which other blocks, um, and which, multi again, the, uh, it also, uh, the configuration memory also configures the multipliers and the block RAM in the, uh, in the FPGA. Um, the <coughs> because the SRAM, and SRAM is a volatile memory element. Remember that uh, volatile memory elements, when you turn the power off, the memory disappears. So in order to write a program into an FPGA and have it stored there, there has to be a separate non-volatile memory that remembers the configuration uh, memory bits. And then when the, when the FPGA is turned back on, all those configuration memory bits are read back into the SRAM, uh, the, the configuration memory of the FPGA. And the FPGA then can restore the program that was written into it uh, previously. Um, so there's, five, there's several different ways of writing the, um, the data from the non-volatile memory back into the configuration memory. Um, all of these are controlled by IEEE standards, so they're all done in an in industry standard fashion. One, um, one interesting aspect of the FPGA is there, there is always a, um, 
device-specific DNA identifier that uh, is, is programmed by the factory, which serializes every single FPGA. This allows Xilinx, for example, if you return the part for, for, because it may have a problem, Xilinx can trace that part to, to the manufacturing uh, process where it was built and perhaps associate that with the problem. It also allows uh, Xilinx to determine whether, in fact, the part that you're returning to them is a Xilinx part or was perhaps counterfeited and manufactured somewhere else. Uh, counterfeiting is a real big problem in this industry because these parts are very expensive and if you can build a part that works sort of well enough um, uh, in, a, in a cheaper process, you can make a lot of money by selling them as uh, branded with the Xilinx label so that your customer thinks that you're buying a Xilinx part. So if you don't buy your parts from a reliable distributor, if you're buying parts on eBay, for example, you have no idea where those parts came from, and you may not, in fact, be getting the part you think you're getting. So this uh, DNA identifier allows Xilinx to serialize a serial number on each, uh, on each um, FPGA and then determine if it is, in fact, a Xilinx part and when and where it was manufactured. This is a summary of four different uh, versions of the uh, Spartan uh, 3A um, part. And you can see that they, they're, they, uh, they're, the complexity increases as the part gets bigger, going from 200,000 system gates up to 1.4 <coughs> million system gates. The number of rows and columns increases for the configurable logic blocks. <coughs> the amount of distributed RAM uh, goes up. Um, the number of multipliers goes up, and the clock managers goes up. And as well, the input-output blocks go up. So you've got far more pins on the most complex part to, to, uh, to get signals in and out of the part than you do on the simplest, on the simplest part. <coughs> the each configurable logic block is cons consists of four slices, and we're going to talk about what, what goes into these slices in, in just a minute. But you can see then that each slice within each CLB is associated with a switching matrix, which allows the, um, the uh, IOs from that individual block to go up into the routing network and then be, be routed around the chip. In addition, there are much simpler interconnects that go immediately to the nearest neighbor. So if you have several configurable logic blocks that are simply connected one output of one to the input of the next, that can be done with this local interconnect that just simply goes from one block to its neighbor. Um, there, are, there are two different flavors of slices. Um, there's the logic slice only, the, the, the slice L. There are two of those in a block. And then the more complicated uh, uh, slice M that have the same logic but in some distributed memory as well. Then there's two of those in each of these uh, in each of these blocks. This is what the interior of these slices looks like. The one on the right is the logic slice. It contains uh, registers, which are a series of flip flops that store um, uh, data or, or <coughs> input output information. Uh, then there's these lookup tables that actually perform the logic, and we'll see how that how that works in just a minute. There are multiplexers. A multiplexer is uh, simply a device that takes a, uh, a number of inputs and based on the, the selection criterion, takes one of those inputs and, and drives it directly to the output. So a multiplexer allows you to take a number of inputs and select which of those inputs simply goes through to the output. So it allows you to uh, um, deliver a number of different uh, outputs on the, same, uh, on the same wire simultaneously. Um, you can see that there are carry operations here. Uh, clearly, there's arithmetic built into the uh, into the uh, logic block. So if, you're, if the function you want to implement includes adds or subtracts or multiplies, then you can do some of that locally right inside the logic block itself. The M slice is a little bit more complicated. It contains all the same elements as the L slice, but it also has some uh, some memory el uh, elements, some RAM, so a small amount of RAM and some shift registers that are also incorporated into the, into the, into the slice. So every block has two out logic slices and two, uh, mem uh, two logic and memory slices. And this is what, uh, this is a blow up of the one of these slices. This happens to be one of the memory slices. Uh, these are the flip flops and you can see they look very much like the flip flops we studied in this class. Um, and and uh, as we indicated, the outputs from these uh, configurable logic blocks can either go into the flip-flop and be stored and be latched, or they can be read directly out of the logic block if you don't want to use um, synchronous type of logic, if you just want to use um, um, uh, 
uh, if you just want to drive the outputs from the, from the logic block directly onto the bus or directly into its nearest neighbor. These lookup tables perform the logic, and there are two of them in, in this slice. There's a, a, a clock driver here. I, I, I'm sorry, this is the write generator that allows you to program these lookup tables uh, with, the, with a write signal. Um, and that's, that's pretty much the insides of, the, uh, of each slice. Um, let's talk about how a lookup table works. In this class, we've talked about logic functions like NANDs and NORs and verters and flip-flops um, that perform logic functions. And we've, we see, we've seen that we can write a truth table for each of the specific um, gates that we've discussed. The AND gate has a truth table associated with it. The OR gate has a different truth table. Um, we've been using, we've been building our larger logic functions by implementing individual ones of those, uh, those logic gates uh, and connecting them together. The lookup table is a very clever way of doing the same thing, but with a different, uh, with a slightly different approach. Let's look, for example, at the two NAND gate. And uh, what I've shown here is a truth table for the two NAND gate, where input three and input four are the two inputs to the NAND gate. And then the output, has, is, is the, as we've seen, uh, the, that would be the output for a two input NAND gate. So if we were to build a two input NAND gate uh, from a logic, uh, as a logic element, we would take these two inputs, and we would perform a logic uh, operation that would generate these outputs. Well, in the lookup table um, version of a two and AND gate, we simply read this, this uh, and uh, the, the, these two other input uh, uh, bits, in one and in two, I've shown is just simply all zeros because they're not relevant to this operation. But we have, a, we have the option now of using a four-bit memory address to store uh, the data one at, ze at location zero, 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 zero. So then when we want to do a two NAND operation, and the inputs are zero, zero, we just simply go to memory location zero, 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 and we determine what value that memory location has. It, comes, it, it reads back a one. So we know that the, this function that we, we're calling a two NAND function, we simply store the value of the output for that, values of, for the, that value of the inputs as a memory location. Uh, if the, if the uh, input the three and four are zero, one, for example, we then go to memory location zero, 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 one, and we find that we stored uh, a value one there for that bit as well. So um, when input three and four are in the zero one state, the memory uh, element tells us that the output should be a one. The advantage of this technique is that any operation can be, can be programmed to give us uh, as, as, memory, as memory location, and every operation then takes exactly the same amount of time. Reading the input, uh, reading the output for a two NAND operation simply involves going to that memory location and and, uh, and lo locating the value of the output. Uh, at two exclusive, uh, an exclusive OR, which we've seen when we implemented it in logic, was actually a fairly complex uh, function. It had two inverters, two AND gates, uh, and an OR gate. Yeah. So it clearly, as a implemented as a logic function, it would take longer for um, the logic state to reach the output when the input changes than it would, for example, for a two-input NAND gate, which is just simply a single uh, gate. But in this method, the 2XOR, we simply program the values of the output for, the, uh, for these uh, values of inputs, and it takes exactly the same amount of time to read the 2XOR function as it did to, to read the 2NAND function. Um, we can have... Uh, we can have more complex logic functions, three NANDs or four NANDs, uh, that, would, that would essentially consume more of the memory. Um, but the, the principle is exactly the same. We pre-program the outputs, which are the values of the, of the bits of these memory locations, to correspond to whatever memory function, or whatever uh, logic function we want to uh, program into that logic block. And then, um, this, this would be a, a uh, a memory array, and these addresses, this, this, this along the top we've got the uh, input three, input four address bits. Along the left edge we've got the input one, input two address bits. So then, de depending on what values we have uh, for our inputs, we would just simply go to that logic location, or that memory location, and read the value of the of, of the pre-programmed um, uh, value. And that tells us then what the output of that logic function should be for that uh, for that logic function. And that's the end of the charts. Anybody have questions? How complicated is it to make the chip that the uh, PGA runs on? 
It seems everything is really, really, really small. The FPGA is not inherently any more complex than a conventional ASIC or a conventional integrated circuit at the same uh, at the same dimension. The FPGA, we show, we show the advantages of the FPGA. There are also some disadvantages. Because this is a general purpose, uh, general array of gates, you don't know as the, as the manufacturer of the FPGA what your customer is going to use it for. So it's not nearly as efficient as taking a specific logic function and laying out the densest, fastest, most optimum uh, 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 design for that function. So the array, it's like, um, Similar to a, multi a microprocessor, even though microprocessors have become very fast and are very effective, it's always much more efficient to design a particular program as a dedicated uh, integrated circuit than it is to use a general purpose uh, microprocessor and then program the software to perform that function. So FPGAs, you can also, uh, again, because they have to be general purpose, and again, the manufacturer doesn't know what your application is going to be when he makes the part. He has to he has to build he has to design the part so it's universally applicable to anybody that wants to use it. So there's always going to be a lot of parts, a lot of a lot of elements on the FPGA that you're not going to be interested in. You may not want to use those multipliers. You may not want to use all the all the RAM blocks that are on the FPGA. So you're going to waste a lot of space. But the advantage, though, um, of being able to program it quickly, being able to uh, change it if you program if you make an error in your design. Uh, typically makes the FPGA an extremely valuable and useful device. Uh, there is a cost um, uh, uh, aspect to this as well. FPGAs typically are expensive, um, but uh, they're not nearly as expensive as the upfront costs in having to design a custom integrated circuit. But once your integrated circuit is designed, if you're going to buy a million of them, uh, it's much more efficient to design it once and then just have the manufacturer continue to manufacture lots and lots and lots of copies of that, of that circuit. An FPGA, if you're going to use a million of them, it would be very, very expensive to buy a million FPGAs and program each one individually. So there, there's a cost uh, aspect to this as well. Question? Uh, can a single FPGA run multiple programs like simultaneously or multiple circuits? You could program an FPGA to, to do multiple functions. That, that's not typically uh, done, but so you um, do them like simultaneously. Though? Um, if you were to implement, uh, conceivably, you could divide. You could you could parse the FPGA. That you'd have to be careful about the the programmer. When you buy an FPGA, the manufacturer will also supply you with a programmer, or you can go to a third party like National Instruments that will pr provide you with a programming uh, tool. And the programming tool would then have to be capable of implementing multiple functions simultaneously. But in principle, there's no reason why that, why that couldn't work. In previous versions of the curriculum, they use PODs, where the logic is burned into the chip. That must be a lot slower in operation than using lookup tables. So is this way faster than the old PLD technology? Well, this is uh, a, pr a PLD, a programmable logic device. An FPGA is actually a one form of a programmable logic device. The, 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 the PLD had a specific, uh, when it was invented, it had a specific format, and that came to be known as the PLD format. That had rows and columns of, of dedicated NAND, uh, AND and OR gates. Um, and Yes, clearly, if you had a complex function that involved lots of ands and lots of ors, um, the PLD would have to go through all of those uh, uh, logic gates. The, sig the input signals would have to pass through each of those logic gates before it finally reached the output. So in fact, it would in fact be a little bit slower. The other reason why it might be slower is that PLDs tend to be old technology implemented in older uh, silicon technologies. Whereas these FPGAs are being built in very fast, very modern technologies, I suspect there probably wouldn't be much of a difference between a PLD and an FPGA if they were both built in the same technology. Um, the FPGA tends to be a little bit more flexible. The lookup table is kind of a, an intriguing way of doing a logic design. It's, uh, it, it took me a long time to figure out what these lookup tables were actually doing until the light bulb finally came on, and I thought, that's very clever, that's very interesting. 
But there's no reason why you couldn't implement. In fact, older uh, older gate arrays um, do have distribu distributed ANDs and OR gates that are the old-fashioned logic gates that we've been studying in this class. Could you quickly introduce yourself, say who you are and what you're uh, doing here? Sure. I'm Don Mayer. Um, I'm an engineer at the Aerospace Corporation in Los Angeles. I've been coming to Palos Verdes High School now for several years, helping Mr. Robertson teach the digital electronics class. So just, just so we know <coughs> who you're talking to, look at these bright-eyed, bushy yeah. tails. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the zero period class they meet at 7 o'clock in the morning. That looks like that's why they look like they're pretty scruffy yeah. and... That's what we feel like. <laughs> okay, and we really appreciate Don... We really appreciate Don coming in and um, giving us the benefit of his industry expertise. <laughs> <laughs>